Hey, good morning, good afternoon, Martin Hatchell. Hello, Ron. Good evening. We are live. We are. We are live. Indeed. Good evening there. And it is Tuesday, January 28th, 2014, and this is your Travel Tuesday Hangout, focusing on storytelling on the social web. Am I coming across at all live to you in this video? Because I seem to be a little bit delayed on this side. I can I can hear you, uh, but you're not very well. You're not very well. Uh, voice mouth syncing. Uh, 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 what is this? Uh, you know, your lip syncing is not very good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, maybe if we do it from both sides of the of the of the of the pond. Uh, the joy of oh joy. That's exactly exactly. <laughs> Cross your fingers. Well, what is the last we've been talking about influence. And Martin, for yourself, uh, can you tell us a little bit, you know, what are these words, these iconic words in travel? Uh, to you, what's a story in storytelling? I am giving more and more time to thinking about what a story is. And I don't think it's necessarily uh, one author and one narrative. I think a story is always a, a selection or a collection of information about places and the way people interact in them and about people and the way they interact together. I don't think um, a story, uh, you know, we, we mustn't um, force ourselves to think of a story in terms of the hunt for Red October or um, the uh, uh, you know King Lear, Shakespeare's King Lear, those kind of huge uh, iconic works of movies or books or plays or uh, you know a story. I I have seen fantastic tweets where a whole story is told in 140 characters or less. And there are also those uh, communities who seem to be able to find ways of uh, talking to us and telling us their stories. And, and, and I think a very good example of that is the TED community, you know, technology, education and design, entertainment and design, the TED Talks people. But that's a very formalized version of the community. Um, also, I have a particular interest in the Middle Stone Age archaeology of South Africa, and um, I've been reading uh, a fascinating book on the rock art uh, of the Cedarberg, uh, which is an area sort of north of Cape Town, famous for its rock art, um, where, where the paintings go back tens of thousands of years. And those stories are stories no less. Um, and in fact, stories probably even more, because they talk to us over the generations. So all of that together, and the, um, uh, th this is where the internet is so fantastic, because it allows you to do all of that. And here's Ethan. Well, now gents. the party's really getting started. I, I believe it's Ethan's birthday. Congratulations. It is indeed. Happy Thank birthday, you. Ethan. Thank Happy you. Birthday, Thank you. Ethan. In Afrikaans, veel geluk, lieve Mikey, omdat jy verjaar. <laughs> Mag die heren jou sien, en nog my jare spaar. And I'm not going to translate it for you, but I just wished you happy birthday, dear friend. <laughs> All right, and how do I say thank you? Bye, a donkey. Bye, a donkey. I hope we don't have to pay donkey. copyright for that. Bye, a donkey. Bye, a donkey. Well, bye, a donkey. Then. Thank you. Well then. Well then. So Let me put up who I am. Please do. Uh, Ethan, we're just kind of uh, doing some riffs on the new nature of stories and storytelling. Uh, mm. ha have the words dramatically changed in the past 20 years? The words people use to tell stories or the p words people use to describe what a story is? I think the words people use to, what, to describe what a story is. Is a story, no. what, is a story still the same thing as it was 20 years ago? I think there's a lot of jargon that's been wrapped around it, but I think the 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 core is the same. 
In other words, it's kind of like that, you know, there are really only, I don't know what the numbers people use are, but there are only really 15 story story ideas in the world, and people just use the same story ideas in many different ways. Um, you know, love, boy meets girl, or boy meets boy, or girl meets girl, and then the trials and tribulations around that, and personal development, and loss there. You know, there's only a limited number of story items, and those story items continue to be the same. We just we just use different media, in the plural sense of medium, uh, to tell it, tell them. You know, I remember what like, twenty twenty five years ago we had that amazing series of books that were just so awful, but great idea, which was you know choose your own adventure, and you would go through the the fictionalized story, and if you wanted the the hero to go left, you would turn to page 47. If you wanted the hero to go right, you would turn to page 35. On and on, and you would go through this, you know, story that was printed in one of those dead trees. Uh, we have so many more opportunities. Ron said he might freeze. Uh, um, okay. uh, Ethan. I, I was suggesting that stories don't necessarily need uh, anymore a single narrator uh, and, and that stories can now be produced by communities. The ultimate example I think is the TED community, the TED Talks, but also local communities and uh, you know that, that can vary in quality and that sort of thing but, but it's still, you know, it's, it's, it's people talking about their position in the world um, that makes a story a story, I think. They're, they're, you know, and I'm going to agree with you, but I'm going to take a, a different tack on it that looks at it from a different perspective. And it's um, bringing in a concept that I've loved for 15 and I don't, can't remember when I read the short story, but it's uh, Jose Luis Bortes, uh, the Argentinian, I believe, the South American fabulous writer, um, mm. who wrote a story. And I can't remember if it's a book or a story. I should actually go and search the specifics. Um, who wrote a story about something called the Aleph. Aleph being the Hebrew, uh, the first letter in the Hebrew alphabet, wow. um, like A. Uh, but the concept of the Aleph, which I remember looking up at the time, is not new to him. He just put, He just applied it in a different way. The concept of the Aleph is that there exists in the world somewhere a single point that if you as a human look through that single point you can see everything in the world from everyone's perspective at the same time um, and I don't want to call it the God portal or I think there are a lot of different names for it and uh, one of the different concepts is that it is God, uh, or a God, or deity, or greater force that can see all things at the same time from everyone's perspective simultaneously, um, but that if a human were to find this, this point, and it really is in the one-dimensional sense, it's a non-existing, it, do, it doesn't exist in real time because it is a single one-dimensional point. If, if it were possible to find this point, then if you looked, peered through it or into it, your understanding of everything would be so complete because you would see everything from everyone's perspective at the same time. And I've always thought that was a magical thing to strive for in storytelling, in, um, in, in story conception. And sort of what you said, but instead of, instead of it being from the single author perspective, it, uh, the multiple author perspective, that the tools we have today, but same as the tools we've had for a long time, allow us to imagine a tale from multiple perspectives, seen through multiple eyes and shared through multiple voices. Brilliant, brilliant suggestion, Ethan. But um, well, not but and maybe the Aleph is the internet. Maybe this is the the tool that we finally got that allows us to see the world from so many different perspectives. Um, I had some uh, 
uh, wonderful discussions on Twitter about about probably 20 different subjects with people from people I've never met before over the last two or three days. Uh, so I've got so many new perspectives that are coming into me all the time, and everybody who's engaged in the social work has that. And if we allow ourselves to open up and um, uh, and allow ourselves uh, to to empathise and to uh, allow our uh, interlocutors to to interact with us without putting our ego in the way, we can listen to their stories and we can get those all those different perspectives of all the different people. Um, because if there are seven billion people in the world, there are in the world there are seven billion perspectives, probably fourteen billion. So how does that yeah, how does that um, uh, wonderful theory transport itself into the actual practical uh, um, application of putting stories on the web in order to uh, influence people? Um, and you're probably the, a very good one to answer that question because of outbound. Yeah. Um. <laughs> you don't sound convinced. No, no, no. Uh, the I am convinced of the value of outbounding. We'll come to that. I don't want to do a commercial pitch just yet. I'm teasing. <laughs> um, I'm teasing. Uh, the storytelling is ancient, obviously, uh, and storytelling is the value of putting yourself in another person's shoes or asking somebody to dress themselves, dress them, dress him or herself in another person's clothes um, and see the world from another person's perspective. Uh, so that, what you described as that openness and that lack of ego and that acceptance of the other is something that I've always held to be fundamental to the true value, the beauty of storytelling. Um, but what worries me, and just to overlay this with a little bit of, of, of seriousness, or not seriousness, but a little an overlay of trouble, of, of worry, um, what worries me about what has happened with the Internet, while I do see and share with you the thought that maybe the Internet is this olive, this, this portal, this portal to every perspective in the world, and this portal to every vision, this, this shoehorn that can place you in everyone else's shoes, this, this dress dummy that you can that allow you to, to be in everyone else's clothes, what worries me about it is that it is not always in terms of best practices, the place where people go to be open and sharing and unselfish. It's the place where too many people go to push their own perspective and to force their own opinion um, and to ungenerously dominate. Uh, and this goes into levels of policy and governmental practice and all sorts of other things. I wish, and I think this is what the concept of the Aleph is that's different from what the Internet is, I wish it were more, it, 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 it obliged people <laughs> in, a, in, a, in a forgiving way. I wish it, it were more forgiving and people were more forgiving on it. Yeah, but that, that, that is something that I totally, uh, I, I totally uh, agree with you and uh, unfortunately it's the, it's the human it's the human nature element, that mm -hmm. negative side of our of our natures that uh, that's that's upsetting us there. Yeah, Ron, are you there now again? Oh, I'm here. If you can hear me, but oh. I'm having we can some, hear you. I'm having these uh, wonderful technical difficulties of uh, of actually getting the computer to not uh, go through a crisis. Yes, but at least you're having coffee. We could have shared. I am having coffee. <laughs> we get enough for us a cup. <laughs> and let's see if I'm, we're still broadcasting. Are we still broadcasting here? No, we're still broadcasting. Yeah. So Looks like it. Yeah. Ron, are you there now again? Oh, I'm, I'm, oh, I'm, I'm of course, here. on two different machines. We can hear you. I'm having these uh, wonderful technical difficulties. So, and uh, now I'm getting my own self repeated. Thank you very much, Sharon. Uh, 
having the window on in the background. All right, well, that was interesting. Last week during a during a wonderful hangout, uh, the uh, the laptop that I like to use I made an unceremonious uh, kerplop onto the floor. So I'm using some backup computers, which really haven't been updated in three years. So I was impressed that we do as well as we did starting. <clears throat> well, you know, what I would jump in and just say, I think we have a, a, a tremendous lack of empathy and a lack of curiosity. You know, to what degree do, you know, we go, to what degree do we see so many people taking umpteen selfies of themselves and really not asking other people about how they feel. It's why in the Responsible Tourism Photography presentation uh, I have on SlideShare and that I've written uh, for Transitions Abroad, you know, it's asking, you know, people to take, you know, ask permission before you take a photo of other people. You know, to use photography as an instrument not just of documenting I was here, look at me, but I was able to interact with different people and perhaps photography itself can be used as a way of, of, of learning about other people and sharing people's stories. You know what we see in Teotitlan de Valle in Oaxaca, Mexico is a village of, of weavers, all of which make incredible work, but for the most part they've been literally off the map for 99% for of visitors to Mexico. You know, thanks to the social web, thanks to Teotitlan having Twitter, uh, the artisans having their own, you know, whether it's a MySpace or a Flickr or a YouTube or a Facebook page, you know, that they're making their presence known. And as a visitor, the question is how we engage with them, not simply as a manufacturer of rugs, but as a person uh, with a human story and of which we as a client, we as a, a friend can come in and and purchase these uh, pieces of wonderful folk art. And that's just one example. You know, we see this around the world. It's where, we, whether it's a manufactured good or whether it's food, you know, if we take the time and we ask the person who is serving us the food or making the, making the meal or guiding us, you know, there are ways of interacting and, and participating in these stories. That said, you know, how many of us have been on these tours where, you know, the, the, the visitor on the tour is asking, you know, a zillion questions. And each question that they're asking, they've forgotten the answer to the previous three questions. You know, sometimes we're just asking questions to ask questions. And that to me is, you know, that, that may be curiosity, but it certainly is not mindful curiosity. You know, you made me think of something that I've always thought about, but never quite formulated the same way. Um, per perhaps, and, and this is, I'd have to think about this a little bit more, but uh, I think it is not no secret that I am not always a fan of blogging today. Uh, despite being called a blogger, I don't uh, necessarily identify with a lot of what happens in the blogosphere, in the travel blogosphere. Um, and it, it occurred to me that in many ways the majority approach to blogging is the equivalent of the selfie. It's, you know, putting yourself, it's describing where you are in a place rather than thinking about the place. Uh, and what you've just, Ron, described where you actually take pictures of other people and are, if you're polite, uh, engaging with the other person to ask if it's okay to take a picture of them. Maybe just very simply, at the most basic level, what we need to ask in how we share and write about responsible and sustainable and local travel, maybe just very simply what we should be asking is everyone not to write about themselves. That for responsible tourism, responsible travel week, nobody should write anything about what they do. They should only write about somebody else in a destination because then it's not about then it's not the selfie, then it's, you know, it's, it's the obligation toward the other. I think um, th that I would criticize that only by saying that it goes one degree too far because our uh, understanding of, of responsible travel is that it uh, uh, builds better places to live in and better places to visit and that the responsibility is therefore both on the visitor and on the host community uh, 
So I think it's necessary to see or to hear how people react to the uh, uh, to the environment or the place that they visit. But it's much more interesting and it's much more um, constructive if they were to hold up a kind of a mirror, uh, not hold up a mirror, not, that's not the right uh, metaphor. If they, were to, if they were to paint a picture of the, uh, of, of the place that they're visiting and the, peop and, and the people, uh, portraits of the people, um, as but that's what I mean. Uh, the, artist, the, ar the artist's brush is always going to be present when an artist paints somebody else. Yes. You can't take that artist's brush away because the artist is holding the brush. If I, yes. as a writer, go to a destination, the thing that I most frequently do and get the most satisfaction out of is not writing about me in that place, it's writing about the people that I meet who live in that place. But my perspective is implicit in the in in what I write, so I'm there, and I'm the the my presence is understood, but what I'm actually what I'm doing is putting myself in somebody else's shoes and understanding what it's like to be in that place and what they see me as. This is me as much as I can stepping into the olive, and seeing myself in that environment and understanding another person's place in that environment. That's that's for me, in many ways, what responsible travel is. I get that. Martin, go ahead and let me follow you. But, um, my, I, I go back to a question which I think I raised in, a, in, in one of our previous talks over the last two weeks. How many people actually read what bloggers write? Um, and, and how uh, much does what they write really influence and I think this is the topic that we're trying to, to get at this evening. How much is, do, do, do what bloggers write really influence people who travel and who think about travel? I'll, I'll come to that, but I know Ron wants to interject. Uh, thank you. No, I'm, I'm just getting so giddy that the computer's working. Um, <laughs> you know, Martin and I were chatting about this before, and I was chatting with uh, Heidi Vanderkamp in South Africa as well. You know, there are a number of, you know, campaigns and campaign for bloggers and I remember a few years ago where Heidi and I critiqued some of the bloggers that were visiting Cape Town because you know we really learn more about the bloggers than about Cape Town and you know when I see these blogs that are me 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 I just get turned off now that said uh, the question is how do we measure the effectiveness of whether it's a blog or a tweet or any sort of a social web impressions. And where I think I'd like to see things go requires that timetable that very few people are willing to engage in. And that is not just a, a three-day press trip, not just a, a six-month campaign, but something that goes over, you know, six years or, or 60 years. You know, are we developing the connections and the contacts that we're really proud of and that we can return to in 20 years? And I can say that having posted Planeta for now 20 years and having worked in this field for you know, more than that. Um, and I'm going to take that long-term approach. But it's difficult. It really is difficult. How many times have I gone to, a, to a give a web workshop or to do a presentation? And again, I couldn't ask for a better host. I couldn't ask for better people to arrange the scenarios ahead of time. But for follow-up, I mean, it's always been, always been abysmal. You know, in the first six months after, you know, going to a, to a destination, we're going to call it, uh, just getting the specifics of how one visits a park or how one, or the hours of a market, it really is like pulling teeth. Follow that up six years later, excuse me, but no one is in the same position. You know, the folks working on the press tour or working in the, in the tourism office, you know, they have a three-year shelf life at most. So trying to build uh, continuity within this type of travel writing is difficult. In final, story, a very funny. In final story, I'm going to go back to Teotitlan de Valle, the rug weaving village in Oaxaca. Um, this week, I just received an email, a response from the women of the cooperative, um, whose name literally means women weaving on the loom, and that was actually their email address. 
women weaving on the loom at Hotmail, but of course in Zapotec. But this week I received an email reply from a message I sent in February of last year. In other words, these things require an incredible amount of time and continuity that really no one has to give. So if we want to create the we story, if we want to collaborate with people, I think we have to understand what a terrific challenge that is for everyone. Do I think it's worth it? Certainly. If I can respond to them, if we can update the information about Teotitlan, if I can stay in good stead with my Zapotec Weaver buddies, I'm all for it. I mean, again, I'd like to go back in five years, but it's difficult. I've got a war story that'll that'll uh, that'll tickle you. I think in '98, uh, uh, maybe '99, I went down to the West Coast Fossil Park, where um, an old um, kale and mine. Uh, they discovered things like the first sub-Saharan bears and short-necked giraffes and that sort of thing from 12 million years ago. And they were starting to develop the park as a tourist attraction. And I was given the job of writing a guide to the fossils of the park, which was uh, completed in about six months. And it's never been published. Last year, I contacted the director of the park. Still the same person, very good friend. Still the same person. Still the same. She's a paleontologist, so paleontology works in very, very slow ways. And I said, are you ever going to do anything with my manuscript? She said, yes, we will eventually publish it. It's, it's on our list of things to do. And I'm, what's that now, 15 years? It, it is <laughs> what it is. <laughs> but the point is, uh, well, how much... I, I mean, if we're going to allow our great patience to to how much influence do we have on the web if we uh, if we're not following up all the time and working all the time on our stories and presenting our stories all the time and how do our our uh, clients people like uh, the the weavers or uh, my um, destinations that I work for here, like Muscle Bay, um, um, how do they tell their stories? Um, and, and how do they uh, create influence by telling their stories? That's what I think we should be looking at in the second half of this evening's discussion. I may be wrong, but uh, that's what I'd like you guys to try and help me answer. Because I think I'm, we've had um, a look at While you're talking... Ethan, go ahead. Go ahead. All right. Um, I've um, while you've been talking, I downloaded or I got permission to download something uh, just the other day that I haven't really fully looked at yet. It's from Text One Hundred Digital, uh, which is a, a I don't actually know what it is if it's a PR firm or something like that, and they did a travel and tourism study in two thousand and twelve which apparently they have or are updating and um, on the mailing list to receive it fairly soon. I'm happy to share it with you, the 2012 version. Um, I should say that I, f I looked for this, or I, I, down I wanted to get access to this because I spent a couple of hours, actually, uh, f about a week ago, desperately trying to find information in answer to two questions, one of them which, uh, which was already brought up today. The first is, what percentage of, what, what is the percentage that produced by, this is an answer to do travel, do people read travel bloggers, what is the percentage of overall content represented by travel blog content? In other words, if there are, in any particular day, are 100 pieces of content produced, what is the percentage that is that is created by travel bloggers. And I can't find anything that even comes close to answering that question. I have no sense of how much is actually written by bloggers. Is it 1%? Is it a half a percent? Is it 60%? I don't know where the weight of what bloggers produce is. 
I think it would, it would be revealing to me to know whether it was a huge. Am I still am I still online? Sorry, I just got yes, a notice. Yeah. Yeah. Can you hear me? We hear yes. you. We see you. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you're fine. Right in, the, right in the text. Can you hear me? Have my have my technical problems affected you now? Okay. Um, so what is what is it? Is do bloggers have an outsized? No, hopefully not. Um, the, so the question is: Do bloggers have an outsized sense of self? Do or or is it actually commensurate with their real real output? Do they? Do they think of themselves as being wildly important, whereas they represent a very, very small fraction of the overall output of content on the internet, or, or, or do they really represent a large, a large percentage of it? I have no idea and can't find anything about it. The second question, in the kind of a second part to that first question, is how many people actually read or are influenced by what non-mainstream publisher content by, by non-mainstream publishers of content and by mainstream I mean what people accept uh, as mainstream publication branded businesses um, big branded businesses with multiple actors um, and so and I ended up di downloading this top this text 100 digital index which didn't really tell me anything new I'm scanning it now again uh, the one thing in answer to the shift that that Ron, no, I'm sorry, that that Martin, you suggested we move in in terms of where to go in the next 15, 20 minutes, is the suggestion that recommendations from family and friends continue today to come in on top as the as the ultimate influence over people's decisions about where to go on vacations. More than 60 percent compared to content that is taken in by from any other any other point of origin bloggers um, user reviews uh, mainstream publications it's still friends and family suggestions the question is for me going back looping in back this sense of the olive and storytelling is that not what 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 the internet is providing us with access to our friends and families ideas about where to go and what to do when we travel, what to do locally in a destination, and this the the, the definitions that we that we impose and that I just used traditional publishing, individual publishing and blogging does it really matter anymore? Aren't we really just talking to captive audiences, especially as things like Google are limiting the data that we receive as a function of whom we know and who we register with and what we want to know and from whom? Are we really still just talking in small circles and, and, and accessing information that we already want? Okay, well, I'm afraid. You, you have layered so many wonderful things there, there uh, Ethan. And yeah. let me just take, try to tackle a little bit and then give way to Martin. But I know. Sorry, that came out much more complex no, than no, I expected. This is, you know, this, is what you, this is what happens when you have writers actually talking before they think through everything. I think we could all go back and edit a really wonderful transcript of this. Uh, I, I was I was listening to last week's presentation. Just going, I could have said that so much better. Uh, I could have written that so much better. Let me have another shot at it. Uh, but I think you know, one you know, there is what is called the echo chamber or the digital echo chamber, and the question again lies in the individual. Are we going to listen to people whose views differ from us? And I think if you are. You know, if you if you are willing to open yourself up and uh, embrace people who have different lifestyles, different lives, uh, then you are going to experience the world in a far different way than someone who is looking to cocoon themselves uh, in a way of existence that they're familiar with. I'm thinking of the currently now unwatchable movie, uh, The Accidental Tourist. Uh, with William Hurt, oh, I tried to watch that again. I just couldn't. But you know, the story being, you know, this uh, uh, travel writer who basically was, you know, here's how you can travel the world and not see it. And you know, here's where the American restaurants are. Here's where the American hotels are. Here's how you can avoid, you know, the, the passenger next to you on the airplane. Of course, things don't go 
don't go according to the plan and he meets a, a, a beautiful wiry woman and his life changes. Um, we can cocoon ourselves and I've seen this all the time. Uh, or we can really experience uh, different places in different ways. But that will occur once we uh, allow ourselves to meet people. And, you know, if I just, I can't wait to hear the first person who says, you know, I went to Hawaii to meet somebody, or I went to Hawaii to do something with people. Invariably, the conversation is always, well, what island did you go to? As if that alone is, is enough to merit a trip to Hawaii. You know, if we are serious and really valuing the people, you know, the ambassadors I love in Cape Town and South Africa, the true ambassadors are the Cape Tonians, are the South Africans. And South Africa, at least on, on 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 paper and digital media, is really proud of its people. If we can take that story, if we can take that angle to other places in the world, then I think we transform tourism. But going back to the whole thing with bloggers, uh, if the blog is mostly me, 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 and here I am, and here's a picture of me, and this is what I ate, and this is what I did, I think there are some people that really res re respond to that, and they like that. I personally have never been able to write that way. You know, one, I consider it kind of an invasion of my privacy, and second, I consider it an invasion of the privacy of people I'm with. I don't mind writing about the places that I've been in the narrative fashion of, of, of things from five or ten years ago, but I have a really big difficulty about writing about that today without the other person's permission. But that's, you know, that's me right now. I want to give, give it over to Martin, but I want to uh, acknowledge uh, uh, Abhishek Bell has asked if he can join the chat, and we have sent um, an invitation to him, so I'm not sure why he's not able to join just yet, but we do have the Q&A app functioning, so we're ready for that. Martin? Um, I, while Google, uh, while, while, while uh, Ethan was talking, I, I had a look at the Google 2013 Traveler that I downloaded a couple of weeks ago. Um, and I went back to those uh, figures, which I think I also quoted on our previous Hangout. Leisure travelers seek travel inspiration online. Uh, and 68% began researching online before they decided where or how to travel, versus 65% in 2012. Um, it's that kind of thing. 42% are more likely to use their smartphone or tablet for 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 finding information. So, the online space is being used, but I don't know. It it it, it fails to tell us what kind of um, information is being mined. Is it the TripAdvisor review, or is it the the bloggers? Um, one-sided uh, view that's giving them the traveler that kind of information. I would think from my own experience of trying to find places that it's more the peer review sites than anything else. That That is where travel is being influenced. Um, uh, and the stories are almost unfortunately invariably there. The stories are what I saw, what I, uh, what, you know, what the service was like, and what I ate. Um, so the, the conclusion that I come to is that unless I'm really missing something, what we are missing is that space where the um, communities themselves are telling their own stories. Unless I'm just not finding those sites, but I do go trolling around looking for them from time to time. With 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 a fairly fairly magnificent lack of success. Ethan. Yep, I totally agree with you there. I I could not agree more. I mean, that's what I that's what I started the travel word to try to do and had some limited success with over a couple of years, reaching out to the communities and asking their for their contributions. The tagline on the travel word is local voices. I wanted the community local perspective on travel in their homes um, you know the passionate the passionate champions uh, to step forward and, and and share and share what they believe I still do get some of that uh, because I've stepped out of the um, 
the WHL fold, I don't quite have the same easy access I did to local passionate experts, destination experts. Um, but I still believe that that's something we need to push for. It is just very hard to find. Um, the other, um, uh, um, the other thing is I know that at some level a certain number of destination marketing training organizations are more and more trying to do that, it's going in and working with uh, DMOs, destination marketing organizations, to to urge them to source content from from their constituents to get the information that they need from people on the ground to share those individual local perspective stories. I know that there's a push in that direction, I just haven't seen a great deal of it yet. We tried uh, with the Mossel Bay Storytelling Festival, which is a program which we still haven't got off the ground, but which we're still trying to, to, to realize, uh, which will be a year-long uh, storytelling event on, uh, on, online, um, where we will, our, our idea is to, is to get people to tell their stories either by writing them or through photographs or by videoing them. Uh, and 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 archiving it on on a wiki, um, it's getting that momentum going is very difficult, very yeah. difficult. To do. Let me uh, pause here and, and ask our, our Ron. I can't hear you. Ask to introduce himself. And if your microphone is muted, we'll need to unmute. Abhishek, can you hear Ron? Yeah, hi. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah. It's fine. Yeah, hi. Uh, hi. Yeah, hi, Ron. Hi, hi everyone. Um, uh, nice to uh, be here. Uh, and I've been hearing you all, uh, and it's a great topic to join in. And happy uh, birthday, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, will you? I, I sang him happy birthday in Afrikaans. Uh, yeah. Will you sing him happy birthday in Gaelic? Uh, no, I'll be in, in Hindi, I could say it. Janam Din Ki Hardik Shum Kamnai. This means happy, many happy returns of the day. Thank you. And you say Shukriya in Hindi then. <laughs> shukriya. I was going to say, I was going to say Shukran, uh -huh. but I knew, knew that was wrong and I didn't want to say the wrong thing, but so uh -huh. Shukriya, I couldn't quite remember. No, but it's, it's an amazing topic you've been talking about. I've been hearing all that and uh, I think it's interesting to get the blogger side of things and I, I can see Nathan's point, Ethan's point of view and I can see um, Martin's point of view as well and you know it's, it's I personally write blogs but I don't write about I, 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 I can't because being a researcher I just can't um, write about myself uh, and I think it's important as we, as we we've got to uh, appreciate the destination to, to we appreciate someone's you know we just can't keep on writing ourselves but I can see the point that why bloggers write too much of an eye because they have a readership uh, and they focus on that readership, I guess. Um, and that's what gains them, you know, hits or whatever, comments and page ranks and, you know, all that stuff happens through the readership. And I can see uh, when someone does, say, a video blog of, you know, maybe eating crickets or something in some destination somewhere, they get solid, uh, you know, hits on their YouTube channels. And I think that's what the eye aspect helps, I guess. I don't know. My, 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 question, my question at the beginning of our discussion, Abhishek, was how many people actually read those blogs? I um, think it's, it's just the readership. They have like 20,000 maybe people signed up to the RSS feeders. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's what they gain from that. But yeah, you're right. Yeah, if, if, you, if the question comes back to what he was asking was um, how many actually do read travel blogs online? And that's really interesting to know. I, I, I'm not sure. I think travel blogging itself is very low to the blogging scenario. I think flash and blogging, technology blogging are really high. Uh, I think yeah. travel blogging has just started. Um, and um, fashion bloggers are, are the main, main people who put it on. I, I, have, uh, I have some figures here. All right. I, I run a blog called This Tourism Week, which is not about travel, but about issues affecting travel industry inbound to South Africa. And um, I went over from an open um, 
free uh, email address server to AWeber where I had to get everybody to re-sign up and my uh, list went down from about uh, 10,000 people on my on my email list to about 900 now. But those are 900 engaged people and um, I can see when I look on my uh, my my statistics on my website because it's www.thistourismweb.com. I can see how many people obviously have looked at how many pages and that sort of thing. But but compared to the number of people who read and open the emails, very few people go onto my website. The traffic is 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 minuscule. Whereas my emails, which is my blog, I send my blog out once a week. I send it out to my email database. It's the same text. And it's, it links to the same page. About 18% of my of my database, uh, but between 18 and 38% of my database, open those emails every week. Um, that's a very very small number of people after nearly 14 years of work. And I'm considered to be quite knowledgeable about tourism in South Africa, and my readers are all people who are involved in the tourism industry. So it's pretty much a closed system that we're working with here, a kind of a, a, a closed ecosystem. Um, it's people involved in the industry are reading something by somebody who's writing about the industry, issues affecting the industry. If it was to go to a more broad thing, to uh, you know, this is the nice lodge that I stayed in, and that's the nice meal that I had, and that's the nice waiter that I saw. Um, I think it becomes even more watered down. I think the 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 um, influence becomes even less and less, and this is where you get to what uh, to what Ethan was saying, that it goes back to the travel where your people in your sphere of of influence say you should go. You listen to uh, to 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 word of mouth from friends and relatives. There's um, what going back to what Abhishek just said um, about fashion blogging and automotive blogging and and food blogging and things like that. Well, the, one of the big differences between those verticals, those silos in the travel space, is there is no peak fashion organization for the country of, well, anywhere, for the country of South Africa. There is no peak automotive organization pushing out content for for cars in South Africa, or even, or, I mean, yes, there are things, I guess, for the world. There you know, AAA in the U.S. and things like that. But we do have peak country-specific organizations responsible for the promotion of travel in destinations. Um, and though, and because we have an, a very big industry wrapped around those content creators, those official governmental and quasi-governmental content creators, uh, travel blogging and unofficial or non-official, I guess we can draw the subtle line there, um, content creation is necessarily working in a different echo chamber. The, there's the, there we also have much more specifically industry-oriented readers and con versus consumer-oriented readers. And the people who are creating content for industry are not necessarily the same people who are creating content for consumers. And more importantly, the people who are creating content for consumers live in such a different space they don't even know the people who are creating content for industry. Um, so we've got this really incredibly divided, fractured uh, industry where we have official government representation, where you have official authorities responsible for a destination, unlike in all these other industries where there really isn't any government mandated person or people who can who have control over how an industry puts itself forward in both the industry and the consumer space, and that's part of the trouble. Is the, we've got this, we've got this really heavy pyramid weighing down heavily on different players in different parts of the space with not enough crossover. Um, I completely agree with what you said, Abhishek, about people pursuing their audiences. And Martin, in response to you, there are quite a few bloggers who get more than a million page views a year, and and well more than that in some cases. So they have significant following, significant audience. 
um, and are writing to an audience that they've gotten to know very well and should be servicing and should be and should be responding to. The question is, how much are they influencing that audience, and how responsive are they to changes in the other part of the industry, which is the government top-down, industry-focused side that is interested in transactions and profit and bottom line and all these other things. And where, where are we, why aren't we managing the crossover? Um, and why can't we get all of the players to speak more about the people in the destination rather than the destination itself. Let me take let me take on a little bit of this and may I invoke the name of Anna Pollock and just say, say industry? <laughs> really, Ethan? Um, <laughs> I think there are you know there are two groups of people, those who, who believe in two groups and those who don't. And if we <laughs> look at we're travel kind of tourism, we're gonna look at the people that look at it as an industry. We're gonna look at other people, uh, including Anna and myself, who would look at it as a transformative sector. Uh, if we were to add up percentage wise, where do we get our information about going to a particular place or meeting a particular person somewhere? You know, the numbers are gonna add up to more than a hundred percent. You know, I'm gonna get my information from a guidebook, I'm gonna get my information from from a blog, from information from Twitter, information from the neighbor who just said, hey, by the way, I just took a cruise to blah, blah, blah place, and they have such and such, a whatever. You know, it's going to, you know, it's going to be this uh, vortex of information that will influence us, and by entering into that vortex, you know, we will be part of that information cycling and recycling as well. The question going back to what Martin was posing earlier is: What are the and not that we have to come up with specific you know answers right now, but I think for responsible travel week, February 10th to the 16th, you know what are the practical suggestions? You know what are the practical suggestions for the tourism organization in a particular place, be it local, regional, national, for the tourism owner? You know what we see, what I continue to see. Uh, are the, the tourism business owners that I know absolutely refuse to go to the trade conferences. Second, they are absolutely nowhere to be found on the main tourism portals. So yes, you may have an industry, industry, and I'll use that word purposefully, sector for a specific country. But if I can't get the information I want, then I'm going to look for a workaround. You know, there are two examples. One in Australia, where people were looking for bird watching, and I've said this before, and so they would go to the tourism office. The tourism office had no information about bird watching, so they went to other places. Since the tourism office wasn't getting the queries about bird watching, it concluded that there were no, there was not an audience for that. Or the ex same example for for Mexico, where the person calls the information office for Mexico. Yes, we'd like to see your birds. You know, who are your who are your notable guides? And they look and they look and they look for the information about bird watching in Mexico and they say, we don't have that. Would you like to see our butterflies? <laughs> Until we begin to transform this sector, and whether it's bottom up or top down, but it has to be throughout, uh, you know, we're just literally going in circles with, without making progress if what we want is, you know, bird watching. If what we want is culinary tourism, if what we want is you know visits to the archaeological sites. Ooh, you know, there's Chaco Canyon, by the way. You know, if we want to visit our national parks, then we have to figure out well which countries are doing a good job. Yesterday, in the chat with Rhonda Green from Wildlife Tourism Australia, you know, she was bemoaning the fact that there really is no good uh, uh, forum for discussion about Australia's parks, and she was saying, why can't we be more like South Africa? The Sand Parks has a really good information board, and we can get this information. We, we can really get some good information, and that's where I went for you know my information about visiting visiting South Africa. So, you know, my bottom line suggestion here is we need to create some sort of an inventory, starting with who's doing it right. Um, second, as we look at influence, we have to realize that what's what's true in 2014 is nothing like it was in 2004. Again, ten years ago, you know, you know, did we even have Flickr? We didn't have YouTube. You know, we couldn't uh, easily broadcast and webcast this information the way we can today. 
how that changes blogging, how that changes writing, how that changes, you know, 10 years ago, I had guidebook writer friends, none of whom, in some, like one, one of whom had a blog. Now I basically say, if you're a guidebook writer, if you don't have a blog, I'm not even interested. <laughs> Comments? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's really important. I think Ron, you've got to, you've got, to put it rightly. You know, it's, uh, it's that I know a lot of travel bloggers, uh, and I've been to a lot of campaigns uh, promoting certain destinations. We've done a lot of um, impressions online, about 82 million impressions. This we got in 2013 for uh, Visit Scotland. Um, and CNN rated Scotland as the best destination to come uh, for the year 2013 and in those ways. So the impressions did work. And I think it's important. I think the, the prime focus of certain bloggers now have, have focused on niche tourism. They're focusing on certain, like you give the example of bird watching. They're focusing, like I'm a wilderness blogger. I like to just write about wilderness. I don't talk about myself going to a wilderness, but I would talk about impacts in wilderness and how you can mitigate those impacts and in those ways. Certain bloggers don't do that. They write about how I experienced a safari, how I saw I, w I was with a naturalist or whatever. And I think it's important to actually focus on what you really want to write about. And I think uh, that's how maybe it works online with certain keywords, um, trying to figure out your readership. Um, and um, yeah, it's, it's, it's important that um, you engage, you know, you engage with the audience. Uh, it may be local, it may be uh, within your own area, it may be national, it may be international. But I think the, uh, the topic or the niche has to still run for the travel blogger. And I, that's what I would personally try to, like a storyteller has to convey its education point to its audience, to a certain niche. Uh, and that's where, that's what I would personally feel for this. Thank you. I wonder if we're putting too much emphasis on I'm gonna, the uh, there's, um, it, It's probably total heresy to ask that. But are we putting too much emphasis on the written word? I know Ron's a big fan of Flickr, and I'm a great fan of YouTube. And I think YouTube is one of the biggest search engines in the world now. Yeah, second. Second, yeah. Yeah, after Google, it's the same. Should we, do, should we be doing more video? Should we be doing more um, visual material than, and even podcasts, spoken material? than we we are. Should we be using that stuff more to push our uh, responsible travel and conscious travel agendas? Yeah, I, I like to put something out here, Martin. Uh, I think you've got a really good point here, partly because I know it's, uh, speaking to a lot of travel, travel operators, and I'm becoming a travel operator soon, um, no one's going to read my con content there if I want to get a client. They're going to see, if I put a video there, they're just going to see a beautiful documentary on that specific destination. And if they like it, they'll book it. And maybe I'll have to start getting into maybe making more videos rather than just writing. Uh, and I think it's it's important. I think the, um, I feel that, uh, um, like, I know Ron's um, active on Flickr, and he loves Flickr. Love Flickr! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Martin's on YouTube. He likes to. I'm. I'm good on. Um, I like Instagram and and Foursquare. I like that. But um, apart from that, Twitter is all right. Uh, but I've not actually focused on one specific uh, thing. Um, but yeah, I think it's important that YouTube or maybe like um, may not making readers read too much and just see content on through a video format. Maybe this is 2014, and maybe we need to move on. I think maybe that's that's the best way forward. I guess. I do. Uh, having said yeah, that, I, I think. Still, sorry, Ethan. Can I just finish? Because yeah. it's important. I still think that the 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 long form uh, uh, read is important because um, we can. Any intelligent person will know that you can get a twist or a taste of a subject from a TED talk. But if you want to really understand that subject, you need to read that reader's book. You need to read that writer's book. Uh, which is probably four or six hundred pages, which that person has uh, distilled down into into an eighteen-minute talk, um, and the principle remains the same. 
if we're talking, if we're writing about destinations. In South Africa, for instance, uh, the, the bookshelves behind me, there's probably 400 books there about South Africa's wildlife and our history and uh, our art and all that sort of thing. I'm fascinated by my own country. Um, uh, and I can give you a, a, a minute of, of YouTube, but if you really want to understand it, besides coming to visit it, you would need to um, interrogate that kind of material. So I think that the writing remains important. Yeah, I don't think anyone is diminishing the value, especially today, and especially given the new tools we have available to us, of the visual. You know, this is the age of video in part because we can consume it at our desks in, and at speeds that we could never do so before, and we can share it at those same speeds. So certainly it's going to come into play, and it should because it provides an important, an important uh, tangible, or if not tangible, then at least sensory quality that, that, that people really like. Um, but uh, what I was going to say, Martin, you beat me, is, you know, the resurgence of long form is because there are people who love to read and there are great writers who love to serve those people who love to read. Uh, we, I, the, the, you know, the easy answer to all of this is we can't discount any of the media, multiple mediums, um, because there are different audiences who respond in different ways to different, pre form, different presentation forms. Um, I did want to, because I've got to run in about three minutes, um, I did want to come back to the, uh, for me, just because I've been holding this, this, holding this thought in, the concept of the olive that I brought up at the beginning, and to tie in outbanding since uh, Martin brought it up at the beginning, and to make my one small commercial pitch, um, and because my thought has evolved during this thought, during this conversation, is, is outbounding is a kind of an olive in the sense that it provides multiple perspectives on, uh, on different things within the travel space. Um, but what's important to me and what we haven't had a chance to really discuss uh, together is the value that more and more commercial operators and digital marketers and content creators are placing, again, thank you, on quality. Um, it's not just about SEO-driven writing. It's not just about the quick uh, handheld snapshot. It's not just about, you know, a panorama, you know, the, the, the iPhone quick, quick panoramic shot where things are fuzzy and you can't really see what's what. We have to be able to present things that are meaningful, that have power to them, even if it's long-form personal travelogue, uh, certainly multiple, multi-part uh, profiles, presentations, service articles, all of this stuff is incredibly valuable to different readers who are looking for different information. And one Alice that I'd like to think that we're presenting that presents all of this stuff with an overlay of quality is something like outbounding. This is, this is one new way that, we're, that, that I and my, and my colleagues are hoping to, will, will allow people to access content in a, in a more meaningful way. Well, on that note, and on Ethan's birthday, no less, um, we'll wrap up here. Uh, for those who can continue, uh, we'll continue a, pri a private discussion a little bit afterwards. But for those who are viewing now or later, your comments are most welcome. Uh, I don't think we've buried any specific medium today, but we have discussed the, the, the ever-changing nature of stories and storytelling. So... Uh, my my little pitch here is to join us, please, uh, February 10th to the 16th for Responsible Travel Week, where we'll use all of these different media, including outbounding, and uh, talk up the, the challenges of, of true responsible travel. Any final comments, folks? Just happy birthday, Ethan. Yeah, same here as well. Happy birthday. <laughs> And uh, I think Thank it's um, um, I think whatever whatever we do in, in 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 the mediums that we use, I think we just need to use it responsibly, and it should be good good to readers, good content, and I think that's that's really important for for viewing for, for tourism itself. Yes. I agree with you, and uh, can I make one final other point, uh, Ron? And that is to thank you for. Uh, 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 moderating these discussions and coming up with the idea for doing it. it it's, uh, I think they have been very valuable and hopefully they'll provide value to other uh, uh, Thank you, Martin. users. Thank you, Martin. And, you know, echoing Ethan, I think, you know, one of the big values of this is that we are able to, 
a brainstorm. A lot of you know we're working as isolated writers, and we we go to a conferences or events. But you know it is really nice to be able to hang out with some people who challenge our thinking. So anyway, thank you everybody. Thank you, Ron. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Good night. Good night. Thank you.